Hello. Uh, I'm going to solve a physics problem, a classic one. Uh, it involves free fall, an object falling freely, but it's going to be subject to air resistance. So we're going to analyze while the ball is falling or rests until it reaches terminal velocity. This is going to be a messy process, and I, and I am not going to stop this video. I, I know I'm going to goof up, so please bear with me, okay? It, it takes the smile response. Smile response. It, uh, studies show that you perform better if you smile while doing things because you're happy. If you're stressed, it doesn't go very well. So again, bear with me. I'm going to goof up. All right, let's start with uh, some demonstrations, some tabletop demonstrations. Uh, I have here uh, a collection of spheres, and I have a, a pool ball. And if I drop this pool ball from a particular height, notice that it falls in, it might fall at negative 9.8 meters per second squared, but it's not going to reach terminal velocity anytime soon. Uh, I have a, a metal sphere, it's kind of tiny, so the um, the area, the, I guess the effective cross-sectional area isn't that great. It too isn't going to reach terminal velocity anytime soon. I have here a, a ping pong ball. Now, if you've been paying attention, uh, this ping pong ball seems to float a little bit. I, I'm not saying that if I drop these two at the same time, the, the pool ball might move a little quicker, but um, for the sake of time, uh, let's keep going. I also have a Teflon yellow ball. Now the Teflon yellow ball is going to play a very important part in this demonstration. Uh, so to manage this demonstration, notice that the air mass wasn't dense enough to really slow anything down. Oh, now by the way, so having mentioned uh, density, I'm going to point your attention to the left-hand side of the board. Uh, here's an equation that appears in textbooks uh, for the drag force. Uh, drag force is equal to one half C rho or density A V squared. Uh, so what I've written here is uh, C is the drag coefficient. Uh, the density rho, this is the density of the fluid, whether it's air or water. Uh, A is the effective cross-section sectional area, and V velocity. Now, uh, we're, we're not going to use the drag coefficient in our, uh, our derivation. Uh, we're going to use something a little bit more simplified. So the drag coefficient is going to equal kV. So this is your classic kV problem. All right. Uh, let's uh, reduce, you know, uh, or create a small locality for which uh, we may be able to observe uh, an object undergoing, uh, well, reaching terminal velocity. So let's take, a, let's take this cue ball, and I'm going to drop it into this cylinder. No, I'm not. I've already tried this. It makes a big mess. So you try it at home. Uh, I'm not doing it. Okay, let's uh, think about this metal ball. I'm, um, I'm going to drop, well, I'm not going to drop. I didn't try this because I can't lose this graduated cylinder. I borrowed it from my, my chem colleague. So I'm not, I'm, I might bust the bottom out. I don't want to do that. It's possible. All right, uh, I have here that, that ping pong ball. And if I drop the ping pong ball into the graduate cylinder, ooh, okay. So uh, the ping pong ball does not have enough weight to displace the, the water, the fluid. So that's not going to work. That's kind of a, a fail. But however, uh, I recommend this this uh, uh, this Teflon ball to uh, demonstrate um, terminal velocity. So I'm going to drop it into the cylinder. It's going to make a little splash. I'm okay with that. All right. Now, notice that it kind of moving along on the fast side in the first three or four inches, and then right about here, it started floating to the bottom at a constant rate. So that yellow sphere reached terminal velocity right about the 1,000 milliliter mark in this graduated cylinder. Okay. Now, uh, this is fluid. This is water, um, and I'm sure you. Again, for those pe people that have a. Uh, um, you know, video analysis software and tag that yellow ball on the way down and plug
plot velocity as a function of time, you might you might get the expected uh, graph or an object drop from rest, okay, um, and in the, the first few seconds, uh, you, you may or over time you may see uh, uh, that reach terminal velocity in the graph as well. So I have I have a couple of axes ready to go here to um, to sketch when we're more or less done. All right. Uh, how do you start the process of determining, well in this case, uh, we're going to formulate an equation that relates the velocity of the object uh, falling, okay, as a function of time, and, uh, and, and taking into account uh, the drag force being kb. So, uh, I told you I was going to make a mistake. Um, let's here, I'm going to offer up a suggestion. Well, I'm going to say I made a mistake. I don't want to leave this out. Um, here's a piece of paper. Okay? Uh, I'm going to construct an object out of this piece of paper, but I want to show you the piece of paper and how the effective cross-sectional area makes a difference. So if I hold this piece of paper in this orientation, uh, the effective cross-sectional area is the edge of the paper. And I'm just going to drop it. And it drops like a rock. Now, if you orient the piece of paper in this flat, uh, having it face down, uh, notice that it, it floats like a feather. Right. I learned this trick a couple of years ago while constructing a paper airplane. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to half construct a paper airplane because it makes a really neat inverted parachute. And, and to do that, take this 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, uh, fold one edge over and line it up with the other side, and crease it. So you kind of make a, a, a triangle, and then you're going to do the same thing to the other side. You're going to fold the opposite side over and line it up with the other edge. And let's see if I get that picture right. I'm just, I'm just being, trying to be careful here. And then crease it. All right. Notice that I've more or less made a pyramid. Um, I don't think it follows the golden section, but PDC, pretty darn close. All right, so I'm going to... Uh, that over and you'll notice that if you guys are, have made an airplane like this, um, I'm just going to stop there and make one more fold. Uh, I'm going to fold that extended portion of, of the 8.5 by 11 piece of paper because I want to get rid of that and, and have a, a square piece of paper from which I constructed these I think it's going to end up eight triangles. Now I'm going to lick the edge to weaken the crease so I can tear away this piece of paper. And you have yourself a bookmark okay, for your physics book, or you can write a note on it and pass to your neighbor. Here you go. Okay. All right. Here's my inverted parachute. I'm going to crease it again. So I have here a I counted at one, two, eight sides all seen together. And, I, and it's an inverted par pyramid, but it's really an inverted parachute. So check this out. I'm just going to drop it. It floats like a feather. And I would say in the first second, within that first second. So t to the minus 64 seconds at the instant you let it go. It's, uh, it's accelerating downward at negative 9.8. And that negative 9.8 is going to reduce to zero in a short period of time, and then less the object can be floating down at a constant rate. So uh, there's a helpful suggestion you students or teachers out there to create something out of a piece of paper that uh, shows uh, or demonstrates terminal velocity of an object falling freely. Now you could add stuff to it. You can add like here's this metal ball. I'm going to add uh, weight to it and it drops a little faster. So maybe you can find that place between no weight and some weight. So you get something that looks like it's uh, changing acceleration. So you have a variable acceleration all the way down. And then subsequently it reaches terminal velocity. All right, that's, that, that does it for the demonstration part. So I'm going to chalk up, uh, which will be a mess. And I apologize. I'm not perfect. This again. This is a one-take video. Um, I didn't do a heck of a lot of research. 
Uh, I'm kind of going from what I know, and uh, like my science department chair, my co uh, my supervisor said, you just gotta do what you gotta do. Don't don't get overly uh, fixated on all the all the details. But I'll let you help me with that. So uh, go ahead and comment and let me know if I'm I'm saying something wrong or or uh, I'm goofing up the algebra. But this is how we start. Oh, by the way, uh, every problem starts with a diagram, sketch. So I'm going to sketch uh, what appears to be the the inverted parachute. Here, let me show that. My best picture. Uh, so that's the uh, the inverted parachute, starting at rest at a height above where it's going to end up, uh, and then we're going to uh, pin some vectors to it that represent uh, the forces acting on it for more or less beginning, and and not necessarily the end, but that's uh, essentially what we're going to be focused on on uh, deriving expression for while it's reaching total velocity. All right, uh, what color chalk should I use? I don't know. I'll, I'll use green uh, to represent the weight of the object, mg, going toward the green grass of the Earth. And then I'll show, I guess in red, the drag force, which we're going to call kb. Or we're going to simplify that 1 half c rho a b squared. We're going to simplify it. Uh, to KB. Okay. All right. Uh, so we have a net force event here. So eventually, when KB equals mg, then the net force is zero. Uh, this vector, the way I've dra drawn it in relative length, suggests that it's currently equal to mg. But you have to understand that this vector is going to increase in value as a function of the velocity. So as this thing speeds up, uh, so will there will be an increase in the uh, drag force. All right. Start with Newton's second law, F equals ma. Uh, the sum of the forces along the line of action, which is vertical, is equal to ma. We have uh, kv up minus mg down is equal to minus ma. Okay. All right. Uh, that acceleration is not constant, but variable. Because as the velocity increases on the way down, uh, this force is going to go up. So you're not going to get a, a constant acceleration, but a variable one. So we have to change A, express it as a differential of the velocity. So technically, change in velocity over change in time. Uh, I have a cheat sheet over here, some reminders, and I and I always ask uh, my students to memorize those. Um, so here's our cheat sheet: acceleration is the derivative of the velocity function, or differential velocity over differential time. So each incremental, infinitesimal uh, in increment in time, the velocity is incrementally changing. Uh, we're going to end up with uh, um, after after we've uh, developed a differential equation, which is separable, and we're going to separate it through an algebraic manipulation, uh, we're going to get of the form of 1 over u du. So the integral of 1 over u du is equal to the natural log of u. This will require a u substitution. Okay. Um, I did supply the solution to the differential equation, just so that when we arrive at it, we can compare whether or not I messed up. And then uh, here's, uh, here's the term of velocity. So if you allow t to go big uh, after a long time, uh, this would be the term of velocity, which happens to be the coefficient on this expression. So 1 minus 1. Uh, no, excuse me, 1 minus 0. See, I messed up. 1 minus 0 after, you know, the, the, uh, if you plug in the infinity, be on the same side. That term will go to zero, and your term velocity is mg over k. All right, so here's our differential equation, and in some, uh, some 
uh, say it, three response questions if you're an AP physics student. Uh, it'll say set up the do not solve and just set up the differential equation. And then it just, and then it says solve it. Like here's part A and then part B. Um, so they want you to step through it, not skip any steps. All right, now we're going to solve this. It's a first order separable differential equation with constant coefficients. Uh, if you had a differential equation course or differential equation course in college and you were a mechanical engineer, I think it's safe to say differential equations to mechanical engineers is like organic chemistry to chem majors or pre-med students. Let me know if that was that's a fair comparison. Ah, uh, separable. All right, uh, separable algebra. So I'm going to multiply both sides by dt, divide both sides by negative n, and then divide both sides by this chunk. So uh, this is going to look a little crazy fast, but uh, we have minus one over n uh, dt is equal to one over kd minus mg dv. So this is what I mean by separable. So this is separable algebraically. Uh, some of those second order and third order differential equations take crazier techniques. So this is probably the easier of the techniques in solving differential equations. All right, at this point, you're going to integrate both sides. So we're going to integrate both sides. And uh, let's discuss the limits of integration. So if I drop an object from rest at t equals zero, then the lower bound of these integrals, the initial condition will be zero time. And if we're dropping at rest, zero velocity. But that's not to say that it had an initial velocity, so you would have v initial. But let's simplify this. We're going to start from rest. So uh, upper bound is going to be some time later. Upper bound will be some velocity later, okay? but not terminal velocity. Uh, we're looking at the wild part in between from the time that you drop it from rest until it reaches terminal velocity. All right, uh, let's work this side. I told you uh, this is of uh, the form 1 over u du. So uh, let's do our u stuff, our u substitution. So u is going to equal kv minus mg. And having solved for u, uh, we've got to determine uh, something that's going to help us. M we have to make a modification to uh, natural log u because in calculus, if you take the derivative of something and you want to get back to the original function, you take the integral of it. Or if you take the integral of something and you want to get back the original function by taking the derivative of it, uh, we're going to have to place a constant, I think, especially in this case. And you'll, you'll see my point. Uh, du is equal to, or du by dv is equal to k, okay, the derivative of u, du. So the derivative of kd is just k, and then this is a constant, mg, and the derivative of a constant, 0. Therefore, uh, we have here dv is equal to 1 over k du. So there is our, this is not equal to this thing. That's kind of close by, but uh, we're going to have to multiply um, our integral by one, 1 over k, or our solution to 1 over u du by 1 over k. So this thing all shakes out and it works for us. All right, now uh, take a look at that. I'm going to do some erasing because I need to, uh, I need more room. I'm not sure how much you're at, but I'm going to go for broke here. And if I remember this move, okay. And I'm going to erase this. And maybe I'll erase my differential equation. Oh, yeah, I'm going to erase my differential equation. All right, so I'm going to slide up here. So we have uh, minus 1 over m. Okay, so the integral. 1 over, 1 over m dt is 
equal to now 1 over uh, the integral of 1 over u du. All right, uh, the integral of minus 1 over m dt is simply minus t over m. And if you evaluate that from 0 to t, 0 over m, you know, t over t minus 0 over t, so it's just minus t over m. Uh, one over, integral of 1 over u du is the natural log of u. Uh, now, this is where you insert your 1 over k. Okay, that, 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 uh, that expression I had earlier that suggested I need to multiply the solution or the integral of 1 over u du. So that if you take the derivative, you get back the original function. So that's, that's the importance of that. Uh, now, I'm going to plug in, I'm going to plug in uh, the natural log of, of, of my u, which was, I, I, I got to cheat a little bit since then, but kv minus mg, okay? So I'm going to evaluate that from 0 to p. We're going to evaluate that from 0 to p. Okay. Now, uh, before I do that, some, some people may want to multiply both sides by k. So we get minus uh, k over mt. And you're going to start seeing this somewhere in our, our solution. Look at that. There's the minus k over mt. So I think I'm on the right track. All right. Evaluating this, at least this part right here, from 0 to d, d in for d, you get the natural log of kd minus mg minus the natural log of 0 in for d, which is going to be minus mg. All right. Log properties. Uh, natural log of A minus the natural log of B is the natural log of A over B. Okay, so natural log of KD minus MG over minus MG. Okay, so that's uh, evaluating this side for from 0 to D. Oh, I wish I had one of those boards just slid up. Okay. All right, take a look at that. If you're taking notes, you can always back up the truck and then put it back in first gear and slide forward. I'm going to race the board once again. Um, I'm going to race all this stuff here. Right. This is a very important move I want to make. And that helps, uh, you know, transforming this crazy log expression into an exponential fraction. Notice that we have the exponential e there. I don't see exponential e there yet, but it will be. It's going to show up magically. So here we have minus k over m t. I'm just going to bring this expression upstairs and start uh, working my way down once again. Uh, natural log. And I guess it's safe to do this. Uh, I'm going to take KB and divide it by minus MB and then take minus MG and divide it by minus MG and I get minus KB over MG minus plus, I guess plus one, all right? Okay, uh, I'm going to do a little finger erase here. Natural log is the same as AKA as log base e. Okay? Now, watch carefully. Uh, this is what my mind is doing while I'm transforming this log expression into an exponential fraction. Okay, here's the yellow piece of chalk. E raised okay, raised to that thing is equal to the stuff in the brackets. 
Yeah, that's what my brain does. Just, you know, out of habit. So, uh, d to the minus k over m t is equal to minus k v over m g plus 1. So e raised to minus k over m t is equal to the stuff between the parentheses. All right. OK, a little more algebra. I'm going to clean this up down here. A little more algebra. Um, I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. Okay. So I'm going to place it over there. Uh, so I have, uh, let's see. Oh, no, I'm going to leave 1 over there. So we have kv. I'm going to add kv over mg from both sides. Okay. So adding this to both sides, and I'm going to subtract this from both sides. I told you I was going to make a couple of missteps. It goes to show you that I'm not perfect. So kv over mg equals 1 minus e to the minus k over mt. All right. Uh, technically, that v is a function of time. So I'm going to multiply both sides by mg, divide both sides by k. So I'm essentially going to flip this. And that's going to become a factor on this expression. So here we have the velocity as a function of time is equal to mg over k times the quantity 1 minus p e to the minus k over mt. All right. Does that look similar to the expected answer? Yeah. Uh, I was sweating there for a little bit. I thought I was going to get lost. But I hope this video is long enough for you to follow my reasoning. All right, so I, I successfully determined the expression for the speed of an object influenced by air resistance, the drag force. And we're going from, from, from a rest position to terminal velocity. So this is the expression of what's going on while it's falling. All right, uh, I placed here a couple of graphs just to get an idea of what it looks like graphically. Because yeah, it's an exponential of sorts. Is it a you know is it top out or is it wind down? I'm not sure. But let's look at the velocity function here. At uh, t equals zero, okay, uh, one minus one, zero. Okay. As t increases, okay, put this in your calculator and graph it. But as t increases, it's going to do this. And then after a very long time, if you let t go to infinity, it's going to reach an asymptote. All right, and what do you think that value is? going to reach a value asymptotically and that asymptote will intersect the y-axis or the velocity axis and at mg over k. And that's the terminal velocity. Let's look at the acceleration. Okay. Whoa! What just happened there? <laughs> I'm all turned around. I am so sorry. Yes, I failed. I messed up uh, the last point I wanted to make and that was uh, taking the derivative of the velocity function uh, to get the acceleration function for which we can predict the graph or verify the shape of the graph. So, uh, there's my fourth and last attempt. I'm getting a little tired. Kind of getting late. Video's getting long. Here we go. Uh, so, the derivative of the velocity function will give you the acceleration function. So I'm going to take the, the derivative of this function. First, I'm going to rewrite it uh, as mg over k. So I multiply through mg over k. So 
get mg over k times 1 minus mg k over k times e to the minus k over mt. All right, the derivative of the constant is equal to 0. The derivative of minus mg over k e to the minus k over mt. Now, this is a constant. I'm not going to double think it or go through the product rule, but safe to say that this is going to give me mg over k uh, times the derivative of e to the minus k over mt, which is u, the derivative of u times e to the minus u, or just for u to the u, or minus k over mt. So this is going to give me minus k over m e to the minus k over mt. Uh, and oh, our masses cancel, our k's cancel. So here's our acceleration function. It's equal to g b e to the minus k over m t. Look at that. Our constant variation is the acceleration due to gravity. And that's to be expected at t equals 0. So right here, this point of interest, the intersection with the y-axis at t equals 0, um, is 9.8 meters per second squared. OK, now for the outro. I'm setting up. Uh, that song was Blister in the Sun. I don't know about the lyrics, but I think it's a pretty cool tune. Mm -hmm.